Last night I Googled a lot about him, but there's so much information that I can't speak, and I speak you can probably tell more about yourself than I can, so I'll let him take it from here. Thank you very much, and round of applause for him. My name's Elliot, and I never thought I'd be living in Malibu because I majored in physics my whole life. I went to physics grad school. Uh, but a couple years ago, I had the privilege of seeing John Bogle speak at the Princeton Entrepreneurship Group. And John Bogle's coming here uh, next week, actually, a week from Tuesday. And he founded the Vanguard Group based on a senior, 1951 senior thesis, and that's kind of the story he told that day. But I'll be talking more about him and also how his life is parallel to one of Joseph Campbellian pathologies. And actually, when I saw his book in the end of 2005, it was in the bookstore, on the first page, he quoted Joseph Campbell. So it's so cool that a Wall Street guy is not really quoting the wisdom of crowds or the tipping point, but he's going back and quoting Joseph Campbell. I want to invite all of you guys March 31st to the Hero's Journey Entrepreneurship Festival that's being hosted here at Pepperdine at the Law School. And it's in conjunction with the Kauffman Foundation. I had an opportunity to teach a class Artistic Entrepreneurship and Technology at UNC last year, sponsored by the Kauffman Foundation. It's something I always want to do, base a class on Joseph Campbell's basic Hero's Journey, like the whole class of syllabus. So it kind of is cross-disciplinary, and we, so now I'm working on a book for it, and I had an opportunity to bring it out here, so it's been a lot of fun teaching the class out here. Because how do you teach entrepreneurship? Which begs the whole question, what is entrepreneurship? And can it even be taught? Which echoes Socrates' question from way back when, can virtue be taught? In doing the research, you start coming across a lot of fun quotes, such as uh, Joseph Schumpeter, the stock exchange is a poor substitute for the Holy Grail. Just taking from the founding documents, because the whole story of the founding of America is based on the hero's journey in many ways. But uh, Jefferson eloquently expressed the entrepreneurial premise. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everybody recognizes that from the Declaration of Independence. But it's kind of funny, because the Declaration of Independence goes on to say that whenever a government or a bureaucracy gets in such a form that it opposes these natural rights, it's the people's right and duty to throw it off and start something new. Which of course is very much like the entrepreneurial process of some new company coming along and replacing an old company that's serving the bureaucracy instead of serving the people. What you also notice is the exact same moral premise of that movie Braveheart, right? Because there's that part where he speaks to the nobles and he says, there's a difference between you and I. You think the people exist to give you power. I think we exist to give them freedom and I go to give them that. So, uh, then he needs a marketing campaign to get his product out, right? <laughs> William Wallace had his own unique form of marketing, so it worked. The only place that the word right appears in the United States Constitution's main body is with regards to the Congress will have power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And that's the United States Constitution. And right there you have the premise for all of our intellectual property law. There they have it down to one sentence, but of course you can go to three years of law school and then spend ten years uh, doing different cases and still be lost about it. I think especially in this day and age where we're all of a sudden patents, you can patent software, which is somewhat of a mathematical algorithm which can't be patented, but it's also somewhat of a business process which can be patented these days. So if you couple these two simple passages together, then in the first five minutes of class we have the moral premise of artistic entrepreneurship and technology. So it's kind of fun reaching the Constitution and uh, Declaration of Independence, which of course themselves, uh, when, Mark, when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, he actually said he wasn't doing anything new, but just setting down the best pieces of history that he could find. Mark Twain, in arguing copyright law in 1906 in front of the Supreme Court, quoted the Constitution, saying that that clause right there, and he liked it by securing for limited times to authors and inventors, he said that that trumped the earlier Decalogue, which had said, Thou shalt not steal. First he said, One shall not take another man's profit, but I'm using the polite language. It should be, Thou shalt not steal. So Mark Twain, cutting straight to the chase, goes back to the Constitution and the Bible. Of course, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, both acknowledge, well, the Declaration of Independence acknowledges the Creator, and they're both written within the rich Judeo Christian context and the Mosaic Law that's been handed down. But it's fun how uh, C. Twain. Be interested to see what he talking about uh, the hero's journey in entrepreneurship. I've worked on something called the hero's journey matrix, which is based on the textbook I'm writing for the whole entire class. And it runs a little bit long, but I'll just go through quotes really quickly. Because there's actually so much material when you start uh, drawing from all the classics and then all the contemporary movies as well, which support this. But have you guys heard of Joseph Campbell? Everyone's heard of him? Mm -hmm. uh, before he passed away, George Lucas had him to the Skywalker Ranch to watch all three of the first three Star Wars, the good ones. 
um, before he passed away to actually see his work manifested there. And George Lucas very closely followed the whole hero's journey in all of Star Wars. And Joseph Campbell himself hadn't gone to movies in like 30 or 40 years. So he's somewhat amazed to see this rendered. Of course, the special effects, even the 1977 movie, were so advanced. But they watched them all in one day. So defining what entrepreneurship is. Joseph Campbell says, A hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered. Decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. After setting up the Hero's Journey Entrepreneurship website, I've gotten a lot of emails from economists, actually. And now the conference is getting more of an intellectual backbone of all the economists coming. Because a lot of people have been kind of promoting this whole idea of entrepreneurship and economics in the context of story, rather than economics in the context of like statistical analysis and numbers. And what basically that represents is when you reduce humanity down to numbers, you kind of lose individuality. Whereas the true fount of wealth is not in all the statistical analysis and uh, the wisdom of crowds, but it's to be found more generally in the actual founts of wealth, which is the creator and the individual. So the proper study of economics kind of necessitates a focus on natural rights, the natural rights for the individual to have freedom as opposed to central planning. Definitely something which this country uh, was founded upon, but which it seems the country is forever fighting to show weight. But that's part of the process, and the founding fathers recognized that and left us with a government that could always be renewed. Here's John Bogle, who will be joining us next week, who says, uh, defining entrepreneurship, and he says, but at its best, entrepreneurship entails something far more important than mere money. Please do not take my word for it. Heed the words of the great Joseph Schumpeter. The first economist to recognize entrepreneurship is the vital force that drives economic growth. In his theory of economic development, written nearly a century ago, Schumpeter dismissed material and monetary gain as the prime of an entrepreneur, finding motivations like these to be far more powerful. One, the joy of creating, of getting things done, of simply exercising one's energy and ingenuity. And two, the will to conquer, the impulse to fight, to succeed for the sake, not of the fruits of success, but of success itself. Not long ago, there was an editorial uh, in the Wall Street Journal. John Bogle is in his 70s, and he's had a heart transplant in 1996. Basically, what it said is that he'd left about $20 billion on the table at the outset of fan founding Vanguard, because he could have structured it differently and given him a bigger share, but it went against the moral premise back in his 1951 thesis that the proper role of a mutual fund is to serve the investors with the best possible returns. And here's Shakespeare's definition of entrepreneurship. From a midsummer night's dream, the poet's eye in fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them into shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. And uh, once he's describing, there's something that very much goes on in the innovative process, right? When somebody inventions something and gives it physical form. And I often tell my class, because we talk about it, YouTube has sold for $1.6 billion to Google. And you know a lot of the content on YouTube is kind of pirated or copied or like all the high traffic stuff. If you ever read Mark Cuban's blog, he's always making fun of YouTube. He just has a post up today about it. And saying how it's not, it was never worth any amount like that. But of course, Viacom last week said, take down all of our 100,000 videos, right? And the funny thing is, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, because still the artist isn't getting paid, right? With all these new technologies. That's a whole other part, I won't talk about it today, but it's a whole part of the class is digital rights management which also goes back to the Constitution, where it's not supposed to be the YouTubes and the technological middlemen who get 1.6 billion. Uh, in doing all this, I came across a book uh, called The Moral Premise, and then I heard Randall Wallace, the guy who wrote Braveheart, speak at the Directors Guild. And the book actually focuses a lot on Braveheart, the movie. But it talks about that all of the blockbuster movies like Star Wars and uh, The Matrix, oh, Lord of the Rings, I was thinking of, and Braveheart, they all have a common moral premise in the beginning. And it's also kind of the same kind of moral premise that can be seen at the foundations of a lot of successful and enduring companies. And whenever you start talking about business, you also have to turn back and look to kind of those more fundamental business documents. Because the Constitution, when you think about it, the Constitution of the United States, which has been imitated all over the world to varying degrees of success, is kind of the fundamental business plan of all business plans, combined with the Declaration of Independence. And when you look at them, they're actually uh, very concise, right? You can e read each one in a single sitting. Certainly, the Declaration of Pension can read about 10 minutes. And if you compare that to today's tax codes, right? And so often, the forest gets lost through the trees. So here we have uh, Martin Luther King saying, if we are to go forward, we must go back and rediscover those precious values. 
that all reality hinges on moral foundations, that all reality has spiritual control. John C. Bogle, founder of Vanguard, says, For better or worse, my youthful idealism, the belief that any truly sound business endeavor must be built on a strong moral foundation, still remains today, at least as strong as it was all those years ago. And Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein, it's funny because physicists, my background is physics, they always get say, well, physics, you must be an atheist or something because you can't believe in any of those myths. But here's Einstein, which was a physicist of somewhat uh, high quality. And here's his opinion on it. The highest principles for our aspirations and judgments are given to us in the Jewish Christian religious tradition. It is a very high goal which, with our weak powers, we can reach only very inadequately, but which gives us sure foundation to our aspirations and valuations. If one were to take that goal out of its religious form and look merely at its purely human side, one might say it perhaps thus, free and responsible development of the individual so that he may place his powers freely and gladly in the service of mankind. That whole idea of the freedom to serve and how the government always has to step out of the way of the individual to serve is at the heart and soul of what entrepreneurship is all about. And certainly Einstein, because when we talk about wealth creation, how much wealth has quantum mechanics created, right? Well, quantum mechanics led to condensed matter, which is our entire everything, computers, telecommunication, industry, everything. So you think about it, Einstein and the photoelectric effect, the actual paper they wrote in 1906, has created vast amounts of wealth, right? And yet he's never really viewed as an entrepreneur, because it's kind of like, oh, he's just some guy in the lab somewhere. But it is so true that those people who set off following just kind of the higher ideals of seeking truth are often the ones that return on home, as Joseph Campbell said of the boomer. Here's Joseph Campbell again saying, the ultimate aim of the quest must be neither release nor ecstasy for oneself, but wisdom and power to serve others. And even Adam Smith, who's known for the wealth of nations, before that he wrote the philosophy of moral sentiments. And in that he said, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing, seeing it. And it's, it's another thing, Carl Schramm, the president of the Kauffman Foundation, he recently wrote how MBA programs need to return to teaching more of the traditional classic economists. Kind of those principles. They all said that liberal education is what remains after you've forgotten all else. And the schools have kind of shifted away from that on many levels. And uh, we'll read some of John Vogel's quotes. And one of his most famous ones, his most recent book, out of the soul of capitalism and says, a lot of people say there are a few bad apples out there. He says, but the entire barrel's bad. Now, talking about the ordinary world, and I might not have time to get through the whole hero's journey today, uh, but I decided to go with the longer version of it just for the fun of it. We'll see what happens. <laughs> anyway, so uh, just talking about the ordinary world, there's all these parallels that go back to the fact that I was saying that a lot of uh, schools and just our general culture has dismissed the whole idea of teaching the great books and classics. And we have Lindsay Lohan and Rolando Bloom instead of Audrey Hepburn and John Wayne, right? So that is a difference, right? So it's, 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 there's something going on up there is what I'm trying to say. But anyway, so it's that whole idea of the whole thing of wealth creation. We were talking about how YouTube was sold for $1.6 billion. Well, you can name another entrepreneur called J.R.R. Token whose movies have grossed about $3 billion. Now, when you factor in the video games and the books sold and all of the action figures that I own from Lord of the Rings, I'm just kidding. In fact, in all the action figures and all that, that's billions and billions of dollars. And also there's a lot more kind of cultural wealth from something like Lord of the Rings, right? Something that can't really be measured in dollars counted down from the mint, as uh, Herman Melville said. So as the whole idea in contemplating wealth creation, you also have to look, wait, how much venture capital did he get, J.R.R. Token, to write Lord of the Rings? Well, nothing, right? He just had a professorship. And actually, he also had to put it off because he had to grade all these papers. Has anyone ever seen Fistful of Dollars? Yeah. 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 Yes. Great movie, right? Well, the first of the three spaghetti westerns. When Randall Wall spoke at the Director's Guild, he got, we got to watch his favorite movie before Braveheart. Guess what his favorite movie was? It wasn't Fistful of Dollars. But it was The Good, Bad, and Love. Like the third of Sergio Leone's spaghetti westerns. It's a great business movie, Fistful of Dollars. Because at the very beginning, Ramon is kind of the outlaw, and he sees, of course, Clint Eastwood as the man with no name with a 45 revolver, and he's saying, when a man with a rifle meets a man with a 45 revolver, the man with a 45 revolver ends up dead. Of course, it's Ramon and his big guns and all of his gangsters, and Clint Eastwood only has, like, this little revolver kind of thing. So Clint Eastwood goes, I'll stick with my 45 revolver. And that just goes back, harkens back to the very classic ethos of the Western, that it's always the lone person against uh, the bureaucracy, right, going up for justice. 
you think about it, can anyone name the first showdown in all of literature? Where's the first showdown? Available? Achilles and... The first showdown at the end where the guy rides back into town and like shoots everybody. They didn't have guns back then, so they used a bow. Robin? Was it a movie? Odysseus. In the Odyssey. Odysseus. Remember when he's the only one who can string the bow and immediately following he slays all the people who've been living off of his property? And uh, that classic thing of the man who returns on home and foregoes all the temptations, because you know, that's the famous thing with the sirens foregoing and then the lotus eaters, and then there's the cattle with the sun gods that they're not supposed to kill, uh, but that his men kill them and eat them, so none of them make it home and he only returns home alone. So he doesn't return home just by the nature of his strength and because he's a warrior, but it's also because of his moral background. And it's something that, when you wonder why does something like that endure 2,800 years, it's because it reminds us of uh, the nobler qualities of better angels in ourselves. And there's wealth to be found in that. And that ties back into the fact that a lot of people don't get to read the Odyssey anymore these days. But that's required reading in my class along with Parallels John Vogel's book. It's funny to see all the parallels in books. Classic showdown uh, has been a staple. And there's actually a great book that talks about the action-adventure movie and how it's kind of more of an American product than anywhere else. Because, for instance, in Sweden, they don't make the Western because you don't go up against the state. Because the state, why would you go up against the state? Because the state's always right kind of thing. <laughs> and in certain countries, definitely, like socialism can work in better manners. But in other countries, of course, have you guys ever read Hayek's hey The Road to Serfdom? Uh, won a Nobel Prize for that. It's like, he was an economist, and he's just talking. He's got two chapters in it, Why the Worst Get on Top and The End of Truth. Uh, which kind of sum up like the whole book. But he talks about how uh, central control actually leads down that way. But America kind of has that whole ethos of the Western, of the lone person going off and doing it on their own and being an entrepreneur. Anyway, so I just want to read some things reflecting the ordinary world. In John Bogle's book, he talks about the most recent episode of Market Madness, which to him was the $7 trillion transfer of wealth that happened around 2000, which really bothered him. For a lot of us, like they just tell you, you know, markets go up and markets go down. But when the stock market goes down by $7 trillion in value, where does that money go? Is it lost? No. It goes to people sold high, right? Which were mostly the people like on the inside who said, wait, it's time to get out. Let's get out quick. You guys remember the famous Henry Blodgett, right? And the personal email saying this stock really sucks. The same mm -hmm. ones that he was going buy, 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 buy. Right. But then internal. So it's that whole juxtaposition. And it brings to mind that thing that Achilles said, uh, as I detest the doorways of death, so I detest one man who speaks forth one thing and holds in his heart another. So that kind of came to characterize the whole business ethos. And Bogle writes, the most recent episode of Market Madness witnessed the culmination of an era in which our business corporations and our financial institutions, working in tacit harmony, corrupted the traditional nature of capitalism, shattering both confidence in the markets and the accumulated wealth of countless American families. Something went profoundly wrong, fundamentally and perver pervasively, in corporate America. At the root of the problem, in the broadest sense, was a societal change aptly described by these words from the teacher Joseph Campbell. In medieval times, as you approached the city, your eye was taken by the cathedral. Today is the towers of commerce. It's business, business, business. We have become what Campbell called a bottom line society. But our society came to measure the wrong bottom line. Form over substance, prestige over virtue, Money over achievement, charisma over character, the ephemeral over the enduring, even mammon over God. And he should have uh, mentioned even Lindsay Lillian over it. <laughs> and here's a quote from uh, Robert McKee that completely parallels it. That's a completely different field, which would be Hollywood. Flawed and forced storytelling is forced to substitute for spectacle for substance, trickery for truth. Weak stories, has anyone seen the latest one, Nicolas Cage? What is it? Something oh, writer. Ghost writer. Have you haven't seen that yet? No. Oh, have you seen it? Just like think of it as I like say these words. That's how last night. I go see everything. Sometimes to laugh, sometimes to cry. <laughs> Hollywood imagery becomes more important, more extravagant, and Europe more and more decorative. The behavior of actors becomes more histrionic, more and more lewd, more and more violent. And he wrote this ten years ago. Music and sound effects become increasingly tumultuous. The total effect transmutes into the gross text. Grotesque. A culture cannot evolve without honest, powerful storytelling. When society repeatedly experiences glossy, hollowed out, pseudo stories, it degenerates. We need true satires and tragedies, dramas and comedies that shine a clean light in the dingy comers, corners of the human psyche and society. If not, as Yates warned, the center cannot hold. You guys all know that poem with the falconer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All that, the famous Yates poem. 
Uh, that's Robert McKee from Story. And basically, uh, he's saying the exact same thing that John Vogel is saying. Aristotle had a famous quote talking about when storytelling declines, the result is decadence. And that's kind of what they're both saying. It's interesting that Vogel quotes on the first page Joseph Campbell, the great storyteller. Anyway, so Vogel first heard the call to adventure in 1949 when while searching for a senior thesis topic at Princeton, he came across a Fortune magazine article which stipulated that money managers rarely beat the market. He was a junior at the time. At that point, he worked at Wall Street a couple summers. He actually said, why then he applied common sense to the obvious, the same common sense which let Einstein, Shakespeare, and Twain spin gold from the obvious. Why are we paying money managers? So that was his whole premise in his thesis. And he also read an article about the mutual fund and put two and two together saying the optimum mutual fund would be an index fund because you can't predict the market uh, and any time that you pay managers, you're just taxing the investors. You're actually risking the money. And that's his whole point, the whole moral premise of entrepreneurship, is that the risk taker ought to get the reward. But in today's mutual fund, it actually works out very great for the mutual fund people who take like a 1% or 2% fee. We'll also see Mark Cuban a little bit as very critical of these. And here's quotes directly from his 1951 senior thesis. The principal function of mutual funds is the management of their investment portfolios. Everything else is incidental. Future industry growth can be maximized by reduction of sales load and management fees. Mutual funds can make no claim to superior over, superiority over market averages. Funds should operate in the most efficient, honest, and economical way. So there you have it, the premise of Vanguard. Can anyone tell me how long it took him to implement it after he handed his senior thesis in? Well, it was over 25 years that it took him. And the reason is that the guy who started the Wellington Fund, if you guys ever heard of the Wellington Fund, it was once like the biggest fund like, back in the 50s. It actually got absorbed into Vanguard. He was given a job by a guy who read his thesis at the Wellington Fund. And by the time he was 37, he was head of the Wellington Fund. But he said it was kind of a refusal of the call. Uh, and that's the whole point of the second part here. The refusal of the call. Like a lot of people want to start businesses and go off on their own, but you're always told it is far safer to work for others as opposed to yourself, the way I say. Can I, can I ask you a question? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just read this book myself. Oh, well. cool. And uh, I mean, the whole premise for the book is heeding to the core. I mean, the, the adventure for the hero starts with the core. Oh, you mean the hero's journey? Yes. I think the, the book, hero with thousand yeah. ways. And so um, you're alluding, you're using the book to talk about entrepreneurship. Yeah. For me, um, this is a question I had when I was reading the book as well. It takes them to, it just assumes that everybody has the call and not heeding to the call. It implies that your adventure will not begin and you will not go ahead if you don't listen to the call. I mean, do all, I don't, I don't necessarily feel that all entrepreneurs have this call. You know, I just got maybe it's a trial and error thing that, that sometimes comes with it. But I got that exact same email from somebody. But then that's like so true. Because uh, if you look at any movies, not everybody's like Bowling Malls or John Bogle. So it's just like different people. But then at the same time in this country, when you look at it, uh, small business is the number one force that grows the economy. And it's responsible for the major. So the whole idea that it kind of is a country of millions of entrepreneurs, I mean people in small business. And it's also a way of looking at the whole thing that if you don't take control of life, a lot of times life tends to take control of you kind of thing. But certainly it's not, I mean, entrepreneurship is so defined in so many different realms. Does that answer your question? Kind of, sort of, not really. Yeah. <laughs> You're thinking that quote, don't be a hero. No, I was just talking about refusal of the call. And it just assumes that everybody gets the call sometimes. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you should get it in the next couple of weeks. So, I'll have people contact you. Well, speaking of the call, you guys have all seen The Matrix when Neo receives a package at work? So Neo actually receives a cell phone, right? And so it's a call from Morpheus, so the call to adventure. The Matrix like follows it like almost cookie cutter. And then there's the refusal of the call. The oracle telling you, but you already know what I'm going to tell you. Neo, I'm not the one. Sorry, kid, you got the gift, but it looks like you're waiting for something. What? Your next life, maybe. Who knows? That's the way these things go. And that alludes your next life is the whole idea that in order to find your life, you must lose it first. And that's what uh, William Walsh is talking about, the very end of Braveheart with Robert the Bruce, who's going to like go do business with like the King of England. Then he turns to his people and says, no, we're going to fight him. 
It's that whole idea that the courage to go forth and fight for something and lose your life is often when it's found. And of course, Neo dies in the Matrix, and then it's not until he's resurrected by Trinity that he comes back as the one. So it's just that metaphor and motif. Uh, but yeah, Joseph Campbell, I saw him speaking about it at tape two, and he kind of addressed that too. That he was saying that it, it happens to everybody in life in slightly different ways. And it also comes to that quote too, that some people attribute to Jefferson, some to Franklin, but probably they both said it, that to trade freedom for security, often you wind up with neither kind of thing. Have you guys heard of that before? Because a lot of times when you somebody says, well, it's safer this way, and you go, okay, I'll go do that because it's safer, and you give up a little bit of freedom, that ties into the whole thing of like growing government and letting government or the corporation take care of your destiny rather than you like taking more control of it. Of course, life is all different because there are great corporations to work for, like startups, like Google, right? And Microsoft is once more that way, but then everybody says, well, Microsoft's not quite as good. It's just a natural state of affairs. But it's always coming and going, and new corporations come to be, and other ones taken out. So more than anything, it's just kind of an idea that chance favors the prepared mind. And John Bogle was just wandering around in the library when he happened upon a Fortune magazine article. And it became Vanguard, a trillion dollar fund. Imagine if he hadn't seen that. Things would have been a little bit different, maybe, right? Because his thesis would have been different. He might not have been hired for the Longton Fund. So it's that whole idea of like taking life, uh, the whole uh, risk kind of we've already taken just by being born into the world, right? So that's a huge risk that you even got here in the first place. So just the whole idea that life is filled with risk. But rather than view risk as a bad thing, you can actually view it also as a good thing. And oftentimes, a lot of times, blessings in disguise. Does anyone know what Spanx footless pantyhose is? Yeah. Spanx footless pantyhose? <laughs> yeah. Spanx. Yeah. Spanx.com. My friend Sarah invented that. This is funny. And then uh, <laughs> within six months of cutting the feet off the pantyhose right. and having a friend design a package like Saks Fifth Avenue picked it up, and Oprah walked in and brought a pair and then had it on her shelf. So this all happened in less than a year. And after Oprah, you know, everybody called. <laughs> and then I heard her story because she was just doing stand-up comedy one night and she was wearing open toed shoes and she didn't want her panty line showing, so she cut the feet off pantyhose. And I don't even know what that means, but uh, <laughs> then she got a patent on it. And the pat she's, a, she's a classic case of uh, somebody hearing like a call to adventure, just kind of stumbling upon a totally random thing. And it's that funny thing, too, that there's different people, because some people just cut the feet off and just wear them that night and be done with it. Other people cut it off and go. And that's so true about entrepreneurs that if you solve a problem for yourself, you realize, wait, this could solve a problem for other people, too. Uh, and then she also, she did the unique thing, just, she's like a natural entrepreneur, she made the brand about her. Like you see Spanx by Sarah Blakely everywhere. And she's very personable and just kind of like ran behind that. Uh, but there's those two different types of companies, right? Because Mark Cuban's kind of his own brand, whatever he does. And then there's the people you never really see, right? Like who runs IBM, these, well, I guess it's not an entrepreneurial company. But there's so many companies you just don't know who's really behind it, kind of. So it's that whole idea of the next stage is uh, supernatural aid and meeting the mentor. In some ways, uh, Oprah giving you a phone call and saying, well, you come on your show, that's a little bit of supernatural aid, right? Also meeting a mentor. And here it was in Morpheus telling Neo inside of the Matrix. I see it in your eyes. You have the look of a man who accepts what he sees because he's expecting to wake up. Ironically, that's not far from the truth. Do you believe in fate, Neo? Neo says no. Morpheus, why not? Neo, because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. Morpheus, I know exactly what you mean. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know, you can't explain it, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there like a splinter in your mind driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? And Nina says, The Matrix. Uh, there's actually a book that was written recently. Does anybody here, does anyone here, is the American Dream killing you? Uh, it's written by a former Merrill Lynch uh, banker. He also wrote something about riding the bull, I think, called uh, in the 90s. But it just basically talks, he compares all of modern society to the Matrix. And just kind of uh, the whole thing of like the decline of the handshake, the decline of truth, and just this whole idea that we have the towers of commerce instead of uh, the classic forms of justice and wealth. And the great thing about John Bogle is that he kind of managed to marry the two, right? Uh, like taking like the classical aspects and then going to Wall Street and becoming one of Wall Street's <coughs> entrepreneurs. Because too often entrepreneurs see in a bad light. It's like, oh, those are all the Enron people who rip people off. It's like, no. It's also a lot of people that create a lot of wealth. But as Emerson said, everything has two handles. Be sure to grab it by the right one. Crossing the threshold and riding into town. And in the book that I'm writing, it has a lot more useful information 
Yeah. There's a site, bizfilings.com, and within 10 minutes, actually I did this for a class incorporated and registered a trademark online for less than $500 in about 30 minutes. And then another great reason why the Fistful of Dollars is an entrepreneurial movie, it's funny because Clint Eastwood rides into town and the neutral bartender is telling him, well, there's two warring factions. He says the town makes its money selling guns and liquor. And Clint Eastwood goes, any town that sells guns and liquors must be a rich town. So you have the Baxters on one side, the Rojos on the other. And Clint Eastwood goes, what, the town has two bosses. Uh, that's interesting. The Baxters over there, the Rojos over there, and me in the middle. And the bartender goes, what, getting killed? He goes, no, making a lot of money. So it's a whole idea of like, riding in and playing two different sides off of one another. Classic cases happen all the time in entrepreneurship when you have two huge companies fighting over something and then the third one comes in and does it right. Classic case was when you had all of the search engine market was super saturated in 1998. You guys remember AltaVista and InfoSeq and all that? Yeah. And then Google comes along, right? And everyone says, well, that's dumb because we already have 10 search engines. You guys relate to the game. You know, everyone has a four-year head start, which was an eternity back then. But they did it better than anybody else. And they actually capitalized on the fact that there were a lot of people who hadn't taken the lead yet. So, in a case like that, the market really isn't saturated yet. It's just a lot of people who haven't realized the right idea. And there's the whole idea of calling the bluff, which is uh, tantamount to basically every entrepreneur. And this is a funny thing in negotiations, too. Whenever you sit across the table from everybody in negotiation, your power always lies in your ability to get up on the table and walk away, right? And to say no. Anytime you get in a negotiation, Especially because I came from a physics background, it's funny because you're always treated as a commodity. Like when you do sciences for some reason, in physics, I don't know why it has like a science background. It's like, oh, we'll just get an engineer to do that. But it's like, wait, this is like an art. There's a lot of innovation that goes on. So it's kind of funny that in a lot of projects I've ever done, I've always turned that around and used it to my advantage. Because it's like, all right, if I'm not important, then I'm going to leave and take everything that I own. And then all of a sudden, like the whole project's gone. So then they like call you and go, oh, wait a second here. You can't do that. It's like, why not? It's like I'm just a commodity, it's good if someone else to do it. And here's Mark Cuban calling out the stock market. Mark Cuban, I said a lot of this before, the stock market is by definition a Ponzi scheme. This is Mark Cuban calling the bluff. As long as money keeps on coming in, then there is something to take the stocks from the sellers. If the amount of money coming in is reduced, the stocks indexes et al. goes down. What if, for who knows whatever reason, the amount of money going into stocks declines significantly? Who would buy stock from the sellers? I mean, goodness gracious, you could see something disastrous happen, like the Nasdaq dropping from 5,000 under 2,000 in just a few years. It's happened before, it can happen again. So he basically leads from that going into talking about investing yourself. Warren Buffett is very much emphasizes entrepreneurship because Warren Buffett never invests in stocks, right? He invests in companies, right? And it's only after he studies the company because you know everything about the management and uh, who's an alcoholic and who isn't and who's showing up on time. So he, he doesn't consider himself a stock picker, but more he's investing entrepreneurial thinking about it. And just the advice that he gives. First of all, our favorite holding time period is forever. And if you start your own business, right, you might be stuck with it forever. Right? Also, Warren Buffett tells you to invest what you know best. If you start your own business, you're going to know that better than anybody else's business. Uh, then there's like the classic belly of the whale phase, is that if you do start a business, oftentimes you set up shop and everything, but where are the customers, right? They say build it and it will come, and they will come, but that doesn't always work out that way. Does anyone know the famous in the belly of the whale Star Wars scene? When there are uh, the million falcons in the, in the asteroid, is that? Yeah, the million falcons, well that's, yeah, that's a different one in that one. But they're actually in the Death Star, which is oh, like the yeah, big yeah. Leviathan, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're actually stuck in the trash compactor inside the yeah. star. So that's like the depths of the cave, the belly of the whale. <laughs> and certainly Dante Alighieri from the Inferno starts off in the belly of the whale, right? Middle of the way along the journey of this life, I woke to find myself in a dark forest where I would wandered off the straight path. How hard it is to tell what it was like, these woods of wilderness, savagely stark. The thought of them awakens all old fear, fears, a wretched place. Dark death could scarce be darker. But to show the good that comes of facing the bad, here I must speak of things other than the good. So he's about to walk through hell, right? Which is like that new 50 Cent song, right? I've got to make it to heaven for <laughs> So it surrounds us. He, he's quoting the inferno there. Uh, anyways, then there's the initiation, which is uh, basically you set off. This is the second stage. And you've crossed the threshold, and you're out of the belly of the whale. And now it's the road of trials. You're setting off down the road. Again, the whole idea is that 
that's where kind of the great books and classics, the words come to life. A lot of times it's a long adventure that you're best to find, right? And it's also where the closest fellowships form. I don't know if you guys have ever started embarking on a project, but when things get hairy, you find out who your true friends are, right? <laughs> and your true enemies, right? It just brings a lot, emphasizes a lot of things in life, like choosing to cross that threshold. The famous part of the Matrix where Neo chooses to cross the threshold, of course, he's given the red pill and the blue pill. Right? Take the red pill and I'll take you, show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Take the blue pill and you wake up and forget all this happened. So he takes the red pill. And that's like a definitive crossing the threshold. A great thing about this day and age with the dot com and how easy it is to register for trademarks and incorporate is that crossing the threshold doesn't mean that you're like putting your life savings on the line, right? A lot of times you can start small and build stuff organically. One of my friends owns a bunch of restaurants, and you know, when you start your first restaurant, you sign your whole house and life against it. So that is crossing the threshold. When you're a million dollars in debt with your house and cars and your wife all signed up, up against it, <laughs> and uh, you have customers coming in, employees, I mean, you have to make food that way. So that's the point of no return. So oftentimes, initiation is the point of no return. Though these days, there's that book, uh, Before You Quit Your Job, uh, that talks about how you should just start working on a new venture if you have any interest, and just work on it like 20 minutes a day. And actually with anything, like if you're writing, writing a screenplay or a novel, the best way to do it is to start 20 minutes a day, because that way you're not forcing it somewhere it doesn't want to be. Also, if you just work on it for 20 minutes a day, it's actually a lot more than that, because it stays with you for the rest of the day. And if you do have a venture in the back of your head, that kind of changes the way you look at life. Because then all of a sudden you see a news article that becomes useful, or you see this that reminds you of it, or that becomes useful. So approaching life with kind of like your own adventure kind of gives you uh, a new take on it. You start looking at chances for more positive things. Uh, and here's another uh, John C. Bogle quote. The classic system, owner's capitalism, had been based on dedication to serving the interests of the corporation's owners and maximizing return on their capital investment. But a new system developed, manager's capitalism, in which, Faf wrote, the corporation came to be run to profit its managers in complicity, if not conspiracy, with accountants and managers of other corporations. And John Bogle's book, it's interesting because it's called The Battle for the Soul of Capitalism. So it's actually an optimistic book, suggesting that there's things worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. Another book with the word soul came out recently, written by a former Harvard dean, and it was called uh, Excellence Without Soul, How a Great University Forgot Education. And that's kind of a more passive take, right? Well, the soul's gone, everybody go home. Uh, but this is more like it's worth fighting for. And that's kind of a little bit difference maybe of the academic view as opposed to the entrepreneurial view. That the world is something to be born anew and change, which uh, Je uh, Bogle actually quotes uh, Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, saying, uh, begin the world anew. As in entrepreneurship, sees, it's always, you know, it's never been lost. We always have these higher ideals that we can strive for. Whereas academia, sometimes it takes a more journalistic route, like, wow, things really messed up. Uh, tune in tomorrow and we'll tell you just how messed up they are. <laughs> and then the whole idea of forming the fellowship, test allies and enemies, it's somewhere where you find out who your friends are. The nice thing about the Matrix is everybody at one time or another risks their life to protect the other person. And that's kind of the whole idea of self-sacrifice, you know, like just taking the lead. And certainly uh, when you guys have worked on your case studies in business school, isn't it there's always like some people that risk their lives for other people during the case uh, study? During the class project they put their life on the line. But no, but it's kind of analogous to that. People go the extra distance and do things selflessly as opposed to all of mine credit for everything. But the only reason that they ever make it, just as Lord of the Rings, it's beautifully done, because of course the first thing is called the Fellowship of the Rings. It takes everybody to get the ring to Mordor, and of course it's the smallest, least likely suspect who's the one Frodo who takes it the whole way. Which is another theme of entrepreneurship. It's always the college dropout who builds the billion dollar company, right? So there's that whole idea that entrepreneurship is kind of like a level playing field where it's always open to all. And we should all support a government where it keeps it open to all, to as much as possible. Then there's the meeting with the goddess, and that is basically all different forms of uh, inspiration. It can manifest itself in so many different ways. But he's talking more about higher aesthetic beauty. And my class does both like a more modern version where it's meeting with the god and the goddess, and meeting with the goddess. But Dante had a famous quote, does anyone read Latin? Ecce do forty of me, cubanians don't. Do you know what that means? Here is one greater than me, he stands before me to inspire me. And you know who he was talking about? He's talking about Beatrice, a real person in his life that he fell in love with, who passed away when he was young. And uh, midway through his life, that's how he begins in Inferno, he also realized he had never written anything worthy of her. 
So the inferno is dedicated to her. Of course, she's in heaven and leads him through hell. I don't know who 50 Cent's Beatrice is, but I'm sure he has one. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Shakira. Uh, but, uh, and then you have uh, Trinity, who is kind of Nia's meaning, the meaning of the goddess. And of course, the name Trinity invokes divinity. I know why you're here, Neo. I know what you've been doing. Why you hardly sleep, why you live alone, and why night after night you sit by your computer. You're looking for him. I know because I was once looking for the same thing. And when he found me, he told me I wasn't really looking for him. I was looking for an answer. It's the question that drives us, Neo. It's the question that brought you here. You know the question just as I do. Neo, what is the matrix? The answer is out there, Neo. It's looking for you. It'll find you if you want it to. Uh, and Joseph Campbell has a lot of excellent passages on all the masculine and feminine similar, similarities and differences. One thing about the Odyssey, even though Penelope's at home, there's points where she's accorded more of a role in the success of the Odyssey. I mean, because eventually he has to get home and then fight the battle, right? It's kind of a funny story, because the big battle's at home. But if it weren't for his wife, he would have never won that. It would have been an entire lost cause. So it shows how they're both heroic by their moral substance more than anything. Someone had their hand up? Yeah, or, I have a question for yeah. you. The, the, there's obviously a lot of examples you're bringing up yep. from books and, and films. My wonder is, were these were these books and films written to you? Based on these philosophies, or are you are you extracting correlations between these classics and those philosophies? <coughs> I'm saying, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the person who wrote the movie The Matrix. I've just seen it. I vaguely remember it, but I'm understanding what you're saying. But the person who wrote it was he writing it he as an extension very, of these philosophies? Yeah, no, he he's very steeped in Joseph Campbell. Yeah. yeah, both George Lucas and the Wachowski brothers who wrote The Matrix, and also V for Vendetta. Yeah. We're very steep in Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Of course, we're also kind of, uh, a little similar. Um, you seem very, very familiar with a lot of the stories, and you've drawn a lot of parallels to business. Uh, it, it, in your understanding, have you ever taken any steps to um, realize certain, certain stories are about to be told in business? and taking any steps to invest in them based on any sort of knowledge you've extracted from, from, from these stories. Like for instance, ah, I'm about to see this is a two dollar, or a fistful of dollars situation here. That's I recognize point. exactly that. There's a third player coming in. I know this story. It seems to me, like you're saying, is these are being repeated in business. And is there, yeah, is there potential for forecasting, for understanding the markets? less in an intellectual way and more in a practical business situation. Yeah, no, I think, well, I have three patents pending right now, uh, two for digital rights management and one actually for the moral premise in video games to enhance storytelling. Because mm -hmm. as they approach cinematic quality, they're still kind of lacking a soul and spirit <laughs> of the story. I don't know if you guys have seen Gears of War. I know, because I was from North Carolina, so I know the Gears of War guys. Uh, and they just sold over three million copies for like $60 a copy. Uh, it's Microsoft's Xbox currently leading game now. But it still doesn't really have a story, even though they hyped the story a lot, but then they got a lot of flack, because you guys just hyped that, but it's not really there. But nobody cares about video games. Uh, but anyways, that whole idea, like a larger trend, and that's like the whole point of my class, is kind of like somewhat of a cultural renaissance. Just because people are fed up. Like if you walk around Hollywood, and I've gotten so, many, so much response for Hollywood for the Hero's Journey conference. Uh, actually, yeah, it sums up your question right in the first paragraph up here because it talks about these things. Imagine video games with plots, characters, and epic storytelling. Imagine contemporary novels and movies with the same. With Heroes and Heroines, with Audrey Hepburn and Steve McQueen, since our own John Wayne, a man with no name, right in a town showdown, where story trumps spectacle. Imagine software systems and startups that actually pay the artists in town, the filmmakers, models, photographers, and bands. Imagine new classes, research programs, ventures supporting all this. Two of the guys are coming, who produced the Chronicles of Rhythm video game, they're doing the Transformers video game. They're very interested in the storytelling approach. And then I've got two patents on the uh, whole idea of digital rights management, because still the artist doesn't make money on MySpace, right? You can be a MySpace band and give your music away for free, or you can like go to YouTube and upload your stuff. It's very difficult for the artist to capitalize on anything, even get paid a few dollars. It's that whole idea that not only will you improve the artist's compensation, but you can also improve the quality of the art. Because if you give artists more incentive to create what they I'm telling them what they create, and they can make more money. But does that answer your question somewhat? Following Moore's Law, Metcalf's Law, 
uh, and constitutional law. Like those companies that follow those three things tend to do better. And I actually do have a bunch of stocks that invested on that. That was a talk I gave like four years ago at Duke, uh, but I still have that thing. If you have it, that's like an entirely different talk though. That's kind of the same because those are just three different things that are based on ideals and natural advancement. And I really think that Microsoft might be a good stock because they do devote a lot more interest to digital rights management than Google. You know, Steve Jobs just kind of came out against digital rights management. Of course, because they don't make their money off music, they make their money off of selling the device. I think that that's the whole thing, that these classic ideals are uh, hugely valuable in steeping oneself, making, familiarizing oneself with. Because certainly like John Bogle and the whole theme of the class is that time and time again, true lasting wealth, long term investing comes from the more fundamental ideals. Both Warren Buffett and John Bogle talk about it all the time throughout everything. Because you know there was a efficient market hypothesis which said that the price of a stock is exactly what it is, like at any given time. Yeah, yeah, they won the Nobel Prize for that, right? Uh, but Buffett says, well, there's a huge difference between efficient, like that it is exactly what it is, and it sometimes it's a little bit off. Right? Because Bogle, I mean, Buffett always buys undervalued companies, and that's where he makes all of his money. But the whole thing is that the wisdom of crowds trumps the individual. That's the efficient stock market. But obviously it isn't true when $7 million get transferred, right? Because the market wasn't so efficient, it ended up enriching a lot of insiders at the expense of people's pensions and things like that. But there again, you see it, that it's the actual individual, and it actually is somebody basing on ideals. Buffett says his favorite time to hold a stock is eternity. And that's because it's based on fundamentals, like fundamental ideals. And when you think about it, anybody, any artist who ever sets something down always has kind of like the eternal truth in mind. And that's how art and movies live and die, if they have those uh, eternal truths on them to begin with. So it's funny because I think that in this day and age we're almost taught that, wait, no, it's not practical, right? Like all that stuff, what are you talking about? Uh, in Hollywood, I know, because like these days especially, the, you know there's like the box office like so many remakes because they do like a 70s remake or a remake of a 70s remake or they do like some like the fifth version of something that's been done four times or they do a comic book movie right but it has to have already been there because they don't want to take a risk the irony is, is that the box office is down right it's been trending down for many years and some people say oh, more people are buying DVDs no DVD sales are going down too so what that can be seen as is a huge opportunity because to take no risks in art is the biggest risk of all. Because you can't fake it, you know, you can't hire like a team of writers to fake like a classic movie. Uh, you just get like the full version of like Spider-Man or something like that. Which is fun and good, but there's still something kind of like lacking there. And you can always see the difference between somebody writing it from the soul and like a group that's writing it. It's actually the exact same thing happened to, I don't close with this, William Wallace, who uh, is written by Randall Wallace. The story is Randall Wallace, he said he had two German cars, he had kids in private, like LA schools, and he had a wife and a nice house. And he told his TV guy, he goes, look, we're just producing a bunch of crap here. Like, we could do a lot better. And the t his manager goes, yeah, but the people wouldn't get it, like, out in, like, the middle of Nebraska. And Randall, is it? Yeah, Randall Wallace, I always call him William Wallace. This is a big difference. Randall Wallace was from Tennessee, and he goes, you know, I grew up with those backwoods people in Tennessee, and they would get it. Not only do they get it, but they want it which is verbatim translation of what William Wallace tells the nobles. Because he says, you guys are just interested in titles and lands, just like making cheap stuff and selling it, but the people deserve freedom and I go to give them it. So that was kind of what he ended up doing. So he got fired from his job, and he said he was a major TV producer, and Hollywood's a very close-knit community, so he couldn't get a job working anywhere. He'd never written a feature film, but he went to Scotland for a while, and he saw the statue of William Wallace standing next to Robert the Bruce. He knew who Robert the Bruce was, but he had no idea who William Wallace was. See, that's a Scottish guy. And uh, the Scottish guy gave him a Guinness. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and he told him who William Wallace was. He told him about it. And he was there since the last night he started reading about it. It's a true story that William Wallace was this warrior. Also, a true story that they killed the woman he was in love with who he married in secret because they had that old Primus Noctis that they had like the rights to uh, the wife on the first night. So that's a true story. That's perfectly true. And then he went on the war path after that and all the vengeance. And he also was killed and his whole body was cut up. Very much like the end of the actual movie. But he said, how come no one's done this before? So he said he wrote it from the heart. And to this day when he watches it, he doesn't know where any of the words came from. Because he doesn't feel like he wrote it when he watches it. Because uh, it's just such a tight script and like so good. But there's like just a truth to it. And what he just gone through, you know, like fighting for something better in the world. And like the whole idea that 
the system uh, exists to serve the people and not the other way around. And actually a good place to close would be right on the three parallel quotes from uh, Randall Wallace. I already read this one. There's a difference between us. You think the people of this land exist to provide you a position. I think your position exists to provide those people with freedom. I gotta make sure they have it. And here's what Joseph Campbell said. Man should not be in the service of society. Society should be in the service of man. When man is in the service of society, you have a monster state, right? Uh, you guys ever feel like you're in the service of your cell phone company? <laughs> being in the service of you, right? When you try to get like some, I didn't use that many minutes. Like, can you just give me yeah. like, like hang up on it? I know people trying to get off of AOL. It's impossible. There's even there's someone who's dead for like ten years. They still can't get off. And here's John Bogle saying, after analyzing fund performance, I concluded that funds make no claim to superior over the market averages. Perhaps an early Harvard year of my decision to create nearly a quarter century later the world's first index mutual fund. And my conclusion powerfully reaffirmed the ideals I hold to this day. The role of the mutual fund is to serve, to serve those needs both of individual and institutional investors, to serve them in the most efficient, honest, and economical way possible. The principal function of investment companies is the management of their investment portfolios. Everything else is incidental. So I think we live in a day and age where there's vast opportunities exist uh, for people to serve, just with better quality products, more trust, and integrity. Because sometimes it'll lose out in the short term, right? Uh, but over the long term, it's a good investment. Because uh, Bogle was actually fired from his Wall Street job in the downturn of the 70s. And uh, he said that's one of the best things that happened to him. Because otherwise, he never would have. Gone on evening. But anyways, that's it. Oh wait, one last thing, a funny thing from uh, William Wallace. No, not William Wallace, Randall Wallace. He said that, uh, you know when the movie came out, like William Wallace had an affair with the Queen of England and they had a kid. So supposedly that implies that all the descendants of the royal family are descendants of William Wallace. So the royal family called the historians and said, we're upset about this. We need a public apology for you to like let everybody know that this didn't happen. So he like issued a public apology. He said, "I like to apologize to Scottish people everywhere for implying that the royal family is descended from the Scots." <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't know if that's the one he like told. Basil, thanks so much. It was fun. Uh, any questions? Does anyone have any more questions? Uh, could you cover all the all the all the stages?